Tzum Rabbanon, Yaradeya, and we're dealing with kosher fish, page 202. We said, whoever has a scale, fins has scales. Excuse me, whoever has scales has fins. So, one who wishes to identify kosher fish and cannot see the fins, for example, let's say you don't have the whole fish in front of you, but you do have the fish with, with the skin, it suffices to identify scales on the skin of the fish because we learned that any animal, that any fish that has scales automatically has fins. So once you identify scales, that's the only, there's really only one simon kashrus needed. And that's what the, the Shulchan Aruch says in your day. There are examples of, of fish that have fins but no scales, like shark, whale, dolphin. So if you are in a fish store and you see a piece of fish, it's got its skin and you can see scales, you don't have to look for the fins. It's already a kosher fish. But if all you have is matzalo snapir, if you have identified a fin, because there are examples of fish that have fins with no skins. However, the halachic definition of scales are different than the biological definition. According to the Ramban, halachic scales are limited to those that are peeled off easily from the skin without simultaneously tearing the skin with them. So if you can peel the scale and leave the skin behind, that's kosher scales. If you peel the scale and the whole skin comes off, it's not a right and it's kosher. Kaskeses Elu says the Ramban, hakwin bo. So, so if you have scales, Lush and Rashi, well, they, they just talk about scales. They're stuck to the skin. And they do not move away from the skin. These are like round shells that are like a fingernail. You can peel them off by hand. If it's so stuck to the skin. That fish, if you pull, try to put the scales off and the whole skin comes off, it's not a kosher fish. The Ramah accepts this principle of the Ramban. The Dav Kishem Niklapin Biyad, if they can be peeled away by hand, obikli, fine. If you cannot peel the scale away, without pulling the skin off, then it's not kosher. So let's assume that a fish has a kosher scale. The Shulchan Aruch rules that the presence of even one scale is sufficient to identify the fish as kosher. You don't need many, just one. And number two, if the scales have not grown yet because it's immature or have already fallen off, the fish is also considered to be kosher. Vafilo Ain says the Shulchan Aruch in Pei Gimel, the same sugya. Vafilo Ain Loel is not pure echad, kaskas echad, has one fin, one scale, muta. Vafilo Ain Loata, if it doesn't have scales now, but you know in the species of this fish, atib le gadlam lachazman, o shayelo ba odo ba mayim, it had scales when it was in the water. The Yishir and Miyad, and it fell off balotoli abasha when it came onto the dry land. It's also a case of mutter. So it doesn't have to have permanent scales if it's going to have them later on. Or if it had them and they fell off, it's all kosher. Says the Ramah, 
רק כשהיא עומדת תכלס לחייב. If you have one scale, it's only kosher if it's found near its jaw, או זנבו near the tail, או זנפירו near its fin. וטוב להחמיר. You should be machmir regarding those criteria of where you find the scale. Now, if one wishes to purchase or consume a fish without kosher certification on the fish or on the store, it is permitted to do so based upon these sources, though one must be able to identify that the fish contains scales that are indeed alachically kosher and peel off without the skin as per the rambah and the rambah. And this is noted for Rav Chaim Goldberg, the rabbinic coordinator for the fish industry, in an article concerning the aspects of purchasing a fish in a non-kosher fish store. So to check if a fish is kosher, one must ascertain that scales can be properly removed. Kaskeses are attached on the side of the fish closer to the head and not attached on the side closer to the tail. To remove it, one must grasp the side that is not attached, right? The scale that, the, the side of the scale that's not attached to the skin and gently pluck it from the side of the fish. If removing the scale did not damage the skin, then the fish is kosher. Rav Goldberg explains that the OU does not pub publish a list of kosher fish. So sometimes the names can be misleading. There may be multiple types of fish with the same name and some may be kosher and others may not be kosher. So that's why their advice is based on practical identification of scales based on the fish you're looking that you want to buy. An even more difficult problem arises when you want to buy a fish fillet where the skin has been removed. Once the fish has been skinned, it's nearly impossible even for a fish expert to positively identify fish, as many have similar appearances include kosher and non-kosher. Of course, it's not a major issue, for one who shops in a kosher fish market, or who purchases fish in a package with a kosher ashgach and a double seal. The footnote says, in order to presume kosher, when coming in contact with Gentiles, even in transport, fish must be packaged with a choysim betoy choysim. It's a double seal, a seal within a seal, to ensure that the kosher fish was not switched with a non-kosher one. Any fish, including canned fish, such as tuna or sardines, that does not contain some form of double seal or certification is deemed forbidden. So today, sometimes the second seal may take the form of a hologram or other symbol fixed by the certifying kashrut agency. So if you buy a can of tuna and it's sealed, and then there's a certification on the can of tuna, so that's a double seal. But can a person who does not have access to these purchase fish elsewhere, can you go into a non-kosher fish store and buy fish filet? The Sefer Akasha states that one may not purchase fish filet unless there's a reliable certification stating that it is kosher or a knowledgeable religious Jew who's knowledgeable about fish asserts that he removed the skin himself and saw that the fish was kosher. Or means a, a fish that's been skinned, the atzmot, and removed from the bones of filet. A trustworthy Jew, a meich, a nikat adag, he's the one who skinned it, the ra'atzim and kashutoh, and can testify that he saw, that he saw that there was scale. In our local, Ernie, I mean, I've heard that local uh, is allow you, it say that it's okay to buy, let's say, salmon at Costco and just trim the edges and cut off the edges on the side of the of the fish, as long as it's you know it's salmon, you know, it's categorized as salmon. Well, if you go into a store and you see a fish which has scales, even if it's a not kosher. No, 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 I'm talking about filet. You buy a piece of salmon, a filet of salmon. So hang on. So we're going to talk about salmon in a minute. Okay. We're going to talk, that, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So Rav Chaim Goldberg 
gives us some questions and answers. He's the OU expert. My local fish store is not under rabbinic supervision and it sells fillets without skin. How could I tell if the fish they are selling are kosher? He says, you cannot. Even if the fish is halibut, whitefish or carp, once the skin is removed, it's impossible to identify and it cannot be assumed to be kosher. Rav Goldberg notes later, by way of example, that catfish, which is not kosher, has a very similar appearance to kosher tilapia, and the fillets of the two are nearly identical. So in determining the kosher status of fish, identity is critical. There are two ways to identify kosher fish. By removing a kosher scale from the skin, now the consumer doesn't have to personally remove the scale. The consumer only needs to see the scale removed and confirm that the skin did not rip from having the scale removed. So if you want to, you see scales, you can ask the fishmonger to remove the scale and you can watch it and make sure that the skin doesn't come up. Then you can identify it as a kosher fish, which has a kosher scale. Or if you recognize the fish as being from a kosher species, one can only recognize a fish species if the skin is still intact. It's generally impossible even for a maven to identify fish without skin. For example, let's say you want to, pipe per you want to purchase tilapia. According to fishbase.org, there are more than 30 different species that could refer to tilapia. The FDA officially lists seven different tila tilapia that are marketed in the US. Bernie, that Bernie, what if the, if the fish is mixed up with a whole vat of shrimp and eel and Hang all on. that stuff? Very good. All your, these are all great questions. We're going to deal with them. So to answer Sydney so far, we're talking about this is a, a fish that is on a table, an intact fish. It's not mixed up with anything. We're not talking about fillets. We're talking about, he said, you cannot identify a fillet without its skin. And, and, and if you see a fish with scales, you can have the guy remove it. And then if it doesn't tear off the skin, it's okay, right? You've heard that tilapia is a kosher fish and the friendly counterperson assures you that this skinless fillet is tilapia. You cannot rely on this person unless he's a Torah observant Jew and familiar with the laws of kosher fish. Therefore, one can only purchase skinless fillets from a store under reliable rabbinic supervision. Now this is to deal with Johnny's question. The only except, I'm reading the footnote, the only exception to this rule is salmon which usually has a distinct, distinctive reddish pinkish color. Rav Belsky ruled that a fillet with this color can serve as a halakhically acceptable indicator that the fish is kosher, a ruling accepted by many kashrut agencies. This is similar to the ruling of the Beit Yosef at Shulchan Aruch that all fish eggs called roe that are red are considered kosher as only kosher fish lay this color egg. So too, it has been verified scientifically, independently of the case of Shulchan Aruch, that only kosher fish have such a color roe eggs. Although there have been a number of challenges in recent years due to developments in the industry, the consensus of many poskim is that presumpt is that, that presumption is still correct. So that's regarding red roe. And regarding, you have, there's, a, there's a sheet of Rabelsky that if you see the reddish pinkish color of salmon, then you can buy a filet based on that. The reason why, now, now what about the equipment? This sort of deals with Sydney's issue. Another issue that arises when purchasing fish in a store without kosher supervision is the equipment used to process the fish. Even if the scales are still on the fish, and one can positively identify the fish as being kosher. The store employee may not generally use the store knife to cut the fish, as the knife has also been used to cut non-kosher fish. And there may be leftover residue on the knife. So let's review what we know, what we've learned for the last two months regarding this issue. We're not talking here about a blea in the knife. We're talking about, we're concerned that there's shamnunis on the knife. There's still remnant of the fish that was cut with the knife. That is certainly a problem in terms of 
penetrating, when you cut a piece of fish, that's gonna be left. Now you, you might be able to scrape away the place where you cut. It's not gonna, it's not gonna damage kashrus wise the whole fish, but it's certainly a problem by the makum chaticha. Ernie, I think you've just blown away the concept of eating kosher fish in a non-kosher establishment as eating something that is not uh, forbidden. You know, you know a kosher fish, but you have no way, way of knowing whether the kitchen of that restaurant was using uh, a knife that was used for other non-kosher fish. So, so let, let's see, let's see. This is evident from a number of shulings in the Shulchan Chatach kisu kishuim. Let's say you cut cucumbers. The sakin shall bosser in it with a meat knife. Mutal achlam b'cholov. The grade of bilvad shiigro imokum so even, you, you know, you have a cold cucumber, you have a cold knife, but you always have to be concerned that there's shamnunis there. So sh that means you can't like, clean the knife completely, so there might be some residue on the knife. So when you cut a cucumber with a fleshic knife, you can use the cucumber to cook with milk as long as you scrape away the cut area where you cut the cucumber. Cut away a little bit, kadei klipa, and then you can use the cucumber. It doesn't penetrate all the way through the cucumber. It just penetrates where you cut the cucumber. The reason why the cucumber must be scraped is that it is assumed that this knife may contain residue on it from other meat foods cut previously. In our case, too, one must be concerned that the knife used in the fish store was used recently to cut non-kosher fish and contains some residue on it, which is not always easy to remove. The Shulchan, I'm going to read the footnote. The Shulchan Ark in the previous halakha actually permits cut salted fish that was bought, brought by a Gentile to be eaten, despite the concerns discussed here as well as the issue of Dover Kharif, because the salted fish has a sharp taste. The commentaries there explain that that leniency is based on the fact that if many pieces are brought together, even if a knife with non-kosher residue on it was used to cut a few of them, they are bottled within the rest of the pieces that were cut later without any remaining residue. In our case though, where the fish is being cut once by the knife, one should ensure that there are no concerns with the knife and you have to cut away the area that was cut. It should all be noted, this all assumes the fish is cold. Cutting hot fish with a non-kosher knife would create problems of absorption and the fish would be completely forbidden. Because remember, there, the blea goes all the way into the fish. It's, it's Osir Kula, not just Osir Bamak and Kadena Klipa, Kadena Tila, depending if it's fatty, depending if it's roasted. So. Here, the footnote didn't go into that detail, but I'm telling you that the detail, when you cut a blia hot, then sometimes it just doesn't penetrate kadei klip or kadei natila, it penetrates kula. That's what we're always concerned about. So cold knife, you can scrape away the mokum of the cut. With a hot knife, it's much more problematic. But you're, 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 you're the, I think that the issue is, uh, someone asked about um, buying fish, uh, like salmon from Costco. So when you, when you look at the salmon in Costco, it's all in one area. There's a large number of salmon pieces um, that, are, that, are, that are there. And, and it's clear with salmon that the, it's, you know, the red, the red color. Yeah, Rabbi Belsky said it looks red and it's there for it's salmon. And you can, There's no other fish that looks like that. And you can buy it and I, I don't see anything there that says you have to go and cut away any part of the, of the filet because, of, because you're buying in an area where it's bulk, bulk prepared uh, for uh, for salmon, you know, it's not like they have. It's not like you go to a fish store and they take out one salmon and they fillet it for you on the fly. That would require uh, uh, making sure that either the knife has been clean, which you can ask for them to do, or and the board is clean when you cut it on, or then if not, that you have to go and cut away that in that situation. Well, let me let me let me. I, I'm you're absolutely correct. Let's say let's just continue. Rabbi Yirmiyo Kaganov explains that one is permitted to bring one's own knife and cutting board and ask the fish seller to cut the kosher fish using them. If that is impossible, one may have him thoroughly wash and scrape the store's knife and cutting board first. Good luck. <laughs> right, but that, but in the case of Costco, where- I don't know, I, I don't know anything about I, I, I'm pretty sure I read an article in the OU and I'm, again, I, I could be completely wrong, but um, based, on, based on what I saw, it, it, you know, we buy it, you know, from Costco, uh, the the salmon there because it's mass produced, uh, in you know in bulk. So like you said, you have an issue would be bottled anyway, and because it's mass produced and clearly recognizable, there's no issue with buying a fresh salmon fillet from a large section 
of, of salmon fillets, right, that are already, already pre-prepped and prepared. As long, as long as we know that the knife used to cut that salmon had no sham nunis on it from a non-kosher fish. That's the only thing I can say. That's the only thing we could responsibly say to this group that if, if like he said, he gave an aid, so let, if, if he cuts the filet in front of you and you, you saw him wash the knife and scrape it, I think you have, there's no problem. But we still don't know, even if they laid out all that salmon there, whether or not the salmon has been cut with what kind of knife the salmon could have been cut with a hot knife, not even a cold knife, which is, creates much more problem. So anyways, you know, I'm just reading what we, what we learn here together, we're learning together. Um, how can someone purchase fresh fish if he lives in an area, oh, by the way, yeah, if he lives in an area that does not yet have a kosher fish market, since he may not rely on the fishmonger's assurances, must he forego purchasing a fresh fish? There's a perfectly acceptable halakhic solution. Once you should, one should go to the fish store, identify fish that still has its skin on and identify the scales. One should then provide the store with one's own knife and supervise the fish's filleting. The fish store knives usually have a thin layer of grease from other possible non-kosher fish. One cannot assume that the store cleans the knife between fish to the extent Allah requires to guarantee that it is totally clean. In the rare instance that the shop is reticent to allow, to allow the use of private knives, then you should supervise that the knives are scraped extremely clean. Standard cleaning does not guarantee that the grease has been removed from the knife. So I think they're being very responsible to tell, you know, that these are the, these are the methods of ensuring that you could buy fish from a non-kosher place how we've, we've learned that to identify the fish and how to fillet it. Okay. Page 219. Introduction, the basis for the prohibition of consuming blood. Hilchos dam. In the previous shiurim on the laws of kashrus, we have learned primarily about the prohibition of basar b'cholam, as well as a little bit about what defines kosher animals, kosher meat, Kashrut, though, includes a number of other prohibitions related to consumption. And we will discuss two of these in the next few shiuri. The prohibition against consuming blood, and then the prohibitions against consuming insects. The Torah brings the prohibition concerning blood in many psukim. In Vayikra Gimel, Chukas Olamu Darosechem, B'chol Moshvosechem, Kol Chela V'chol Dam Lo then in Vayikra Zayin V'chol Dam Lo Sochlu V'chol Moshvosechem L'ok V'la Behema. This is Kol Nefesh Hashem Tochal Kol Dam V'nech Basar Nefesh Ahim Mea Mea. Seems like the punishment for eating Dam is Kores. Then in Vayikra Yud Zayin, Al-Kena Marti Levi Yisrael Kol Nefesh Mikem Lo Sochol Dam V'agir Gar V'sochchem Lo Yochol Dam Ki Nefesh Kol Basar Damo B'nafsho Hu then in Dvore, Rakadam Lo Sochelu, Ala Artish Bechenu Kamoi, Rak Chazak Lubutia Chol Adam, Kiadamu Anepesh Lo Sochel Anepesh Im Habasar. Says Dvorim Tesvav, Rak is Damo Lo Sochel, Ala Artish Bechenu Kamoi. So, one who consumes blood is liable to kores. But this is consummate to the dama nefesh, the life blood, the blood upon which the life force depends. It says, Ish ish mi beit Yisrael, min agera gar b'tocham et shirchal kol dam, v'natati fonai ba nefesh al chelas es adam, b'chvati osam yikir vama. Ki nefesh abasar ba dam hi. Now, what is the reason that this prohibition for consuming blood appears so frequently in the Torah? The Ramban suggests, after the Ramban rejects the Rambam's view in Mor Nevuchim, linking the consumption of blood to idolatry, to Avodah Zorah, so Ramban doesn't accept that. The Ramban says that one who consumes blood is considered as if he consumed the spirit of the person or living being. 
since the spirit of a living being belongs to Hashem, it is not appropriate for one living being to eat the spirit of another living being. Says the Ramban in Vayikra, Varoish nefaresh betami suro. The Ramban tries to give a reason for the Isra. Ki Hashem barakol nivram atachtonim litzrach adam. All creatures, everything that Hashem created, He created it for man's use. Ki hulav adob ahem makir et boro. It's only human being who recognizes his creator, who has an intellect. Initially, before the generation of Noah, Adam was only permitted to eat vegetarian. He was only able to eat things that grew from the ground, not any living things. He was given grass and seeds. So after Noach and his family were saved by the Mabu, Noach offered a korban. After that, it became sort of favorable for Hashem, he tir lehem ashchita. So Noach was permitted to now shech living beings and eat them. Kemosha amar kol revis asher uchai, lachem yeh lachla, ki yerak esav datati lachem et kol. Now I've given you the permission to eat living beings, like I gave you the permission to eat vegetation. Ki chayutam bavur ha'adam. It was why did animals live? Because Noah saved them. So in essence, we got the reward to eat animals because animals' existence are basically, they owed their existence to Noah. So the goof of the animal, we're allowed to eat after we prepare it properly. For our benefit. And when we offer an animal as a korban, their blood, because the kapora occurs when we, after we shecht an animal, we collect the blood in a cup and we do zrika saddam. The zrika saddam is the kapora. Without zrika saddam, there's no kapora. So when we sacrifice lefanavi parach, lo sheyachlu, but we shouldn't just stam eat them. Ki ein lebal nefesh sheyochal nefesh. Ki anefashot kulan lakel. Hinei kanefesh adam kanefesh abe malo eina. He says basically the, the 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 ruach in an animal, the ruach in a human being, so is this is is similar. We all have a nefesh behami, an animal. Even Aristotle talked about an an animal, and, and we had a vegetative soul, an animal soul, and then we have a higher soul. So the the so. Certainly the Rambam held like that. Even the Ramban says that there's an issue with humans that have a spirit eating an animal that has a spirit, but they were maturate, but the, the life force is in the dam. So we can't eat that dam. That's the way the Ramban explains the prohibition of eating dam. Now the Orachai Makodesh interprets the reason for the prohibition differently as relating to allowing unwanted spiritual qualities present in the blood to enter one's body. There in Yud Zion, where it gives us the Isr Dam, the Orachayim, there's a nice biography of the Orachayim, he was born in Morocco, he died in Yushalayim. If you go to walk through the old city, you'll see where he lived. It says uh, Orachayim HaKadosh lived here. So, the Orachayim says, Vinei, Bachol Adam Midam Beima, if a human being would eat, Blood from a beima shanefesh yotzaba, the life force blood shalav baanish kores, that you get kores for eating such blood. Kona nefesh abehamit mikoma benefesh adam. Somehow, that animal spirit you you ingest and becomes part of you. Vodienu akosuv kan, and the Torah is telling us ke'oichal dam machnis nefesh apkusav nafsho, and this sort of lesser quality soul. Of an animal comes into your soul, 
it, it sort of detracts from the holiness that you're trying to achieve as you try to achieve dveikas with Hashem. That's what he says. We all have a connection deep with inside us with Hashem. Right? Uh, we are all our nesham, our neshamas are choit, are like all neshamas are part of Hashem, and then they're put into our body. So we're initially we're connected to the kisya kovet through our nefashos. Vu omro mikerva ma asher al kain nitchakem kel norali lab ribak kol aribuim. Hashem is wise, and the amar ki katon begadol yeshno bekaret v'achod amanefe. And we who who are subject to courage when we consume the lifeblood. And this is no matter whether you're small or great, the same sort of uh, spiritual impurity will come into you if you eat them. Okay, so this is we have the Ramba, we have the Ramban, we have the Archaim explaining perhaps a little bit why we don't eat blood. Page 222. Which blood is forbidden according to this prohibition? Does it include the blood of all living things or only some of them? According to the Mishnah Chulin, the Torah forbids the consumption of blood sorry, of domestic I mean, sorry, Yes? Sorry, sorry, no. um, so I'm looking forward a little bit. It doesn't discuss what happens. I don't see over here discussing what happens when uh, clear you have a steak that you cook very rare or, or a steak that you sear, which means that, you know, on the outside it's crusty and the inside it could be, it could be like very juicy and the juicy is clearly bloody. No, no, Chaim. Before you roast your steak, it's been salted according to Allah. And the salt, salting process in Jewish law, takes away all, any blood that's in the meat that needs to be removed has been removed by the salting process. So when you eat your steak, that's just okay. meat juice. That's the, 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 the dam that is problematic for us has been removed by Malik. Assuming, assuming the salting process has been sufficient, you have to have some kind of minimum, no? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a the third tr uh, uh, the test for smicha involves one simon, uh, one baser b'chalav, number two taruvis, number three malicha. We sp we spent one year on the laws of malicha, one year. Oh. So it's it's a huge sugya how to solve properly and etc. So so malicha is has to be done properly now. Do we cover so that? when you buy when you buy your steak from your butcher, it's all been salted halachically. If it's got kosher certification, then it's been salted according to halacha. Ernie, from a uh, biological point of view, you talk about meat juice. What do you think that is? It's blood that seeps out, or serum that seeps out from the blood vessels into the muscle of the animal. It's not if, really a separate entity, but meat juice. It has blood in it. If you were to analyze. But if if we if we follow the principle of that that Shulchan Aruch gives us how to salt our meat, that is, first we do hadacha, then you salt for at least sixty minutes, then you have to let the thing drain, then you need another hadacha, and there's certain you know when you if it's the meat is beyond seventy two hours you can't salt it, so the that blood, as if it's been drained properly according to the you have to use a ramp and. You've done, you followed all of the criteria of what Shulchan Aruch tells us you have to do malicha to the, you have to use a certain kind of salt that has to be very thick, very applied to both sides. And, and, it, and part of the kosher certification is that I told you I spent six hours in uh, high chickens in Toronto observing 9,000 chickens that were shechted and then salted. And there's a, I told you there was a whole machine that took 60 minutes while the salt remained, while it drained. Rav Moshe was involved in creating these very complicated machinery to make sure that the salt stays on it for enough time and that it drains properly and it's removed, et cetera, et cetera. So the malicha process removes whatever blood has to be removed so that we as the consumer eat our meat. The blood that, whatever you're, whatever it's coming out is not problematic blood. So God willing, we're going to hopefully we'll have a sugya on, Mal on Malicha, I assume. Unfortunately, uh, you'll see they're going to say 
there, there's going to be some, but not very much. Not very much. We that's something we could learn on our own. That's Tzur Rabbanon doesn't bring everything in your day. If you take, it takes the highlights, but if there's interest, we can always create a little, uh, maybe a one or two week. I'll have to create my own uh, uh, material, but that would probably do it. Uh, but at least to get the highlights of it. But basically, I've given you the highlights. There is a certain process, has to be washing before, washing after. There's a certain way you have to let the blood drain out. It's got to be salted for a certain amount of time. There's a requirement. It's, it's got to be done within the 72 hours. If it's So there's pro, sometimes when meat has been frozen and sent from Uruguay or wherever, that, that was problematic because it was sometimes beyond 72 hours. So there are specific halachic issues that arise, but we're not going to deal with that. I'm just answering the questions that have been very well posed. The the juices that flow from your meat do not have halakhically prohibited blood because the malicha has taken care of it. Now. Ernie, I'm going to post a video. I just found an interesting video online from YouTube. You can watch it three minutes showing a malicha. It's very interesting. There you go. There so you I'll, go. I'll post it over here in the chat group. People can look, can look at it after. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you, Chaim. I also I also posted an article from the OU about um, about fish and uh, as it relates to buying fish from a large store um, that that has different cuts of of, of uh, fish and salmon and you'll see it in there. Okay, well. okay. Now, by the way, uh, there are certainly people in this audience who remember when it was not the butchers who salted the meat, but our, it was our grandmothers who did it. The butchers didn't provide that as a service. They do it now, but uh, we, I remember on, in my, my home in Hayward, they had a, there was like a wooden board that, that, that went on an angle. Yeah, we did that in England. Yeah, and you had to salt your own meat. So the balabustas knew how to do malicha. They, they were taught by their mothers and they did malicha as well. So, but that's not very common today. It's, it's, it's done by the butchers, as we'll see. It says, The prohibition of eating blood is by a behema, chaya, an oaf, whether they're kosher or non-kosher. Even concerning the blood of animals and birds, though there are different levels of severity of the prohibition. The Rambam explains that one is liable for the punishment of kares only for the consumption of certain types of blood. The blood when you shaf, immediately there's spurting blood. So that is Osir Bukhoris. Oh, Hatazis Arosh, Kosman Shesh Bad Mulus. Let's say you chop a, a, a head off. And, and the, as long as there's still redness flowing, that would be problematic. Veladama Konus Betochale. Blood after you shecht an animal that you find within the heart. The Aldama Koza, if somebody had bloodletting or if an animal was sick and they did bloodletting, Kozman Shuma Kaleach Vyotz, as long as it's spurting, so spurting blood will, would be considered Dama Nefesh. Avaladama Shoises Petchilas Hakoza, but initially when you first do bloodletting, it, it just sort of drains out. Before it begins to spurt. The Dama shows is Pesofa Kaza, or after bloodletting, and then it just sort of slowly drains out. Kishiask Ladam leaves soap when it stops draining. That is not Chai of Alav Koris. Vareu Kidama Evorim, and that's considered like blood that is within limbs. That's sort of the blood that we get out when we do Malicha. Now, by the way, Bernie, if you have any large veins or arteries within a piece of meat, those have to be opened. That's part of the Hilchos Malicha. You've got to open those with a knife and it drains out and then you salt it. So you can't leave blood vessels that have blood in it if there's big blood vessels in the meat. So, but there is blood that is it sort of, it's considered damayvorm, blood that is sort of absorbed within the meat itself, that is gonna, that, that it's not 
Osir Kores, but it's also Osir. So we have to get rid of that blood through the Melicha. However, Dama Kiloch Adam Shanefesh Yotzeh, but it's spurting blood. When you, when you shech and you see arterial blood spurting for the first few minutes, then it stops spurting. Then it's just the jugular vein drains. That ve- venous drainage is not Osir Bekores. Only the spurting blood is considered Dama Nefesh. And it's the same thing by the Korban. When they shechted a Korban, they needed only the Dama Nefesh for the Zrika. They have to get all the Dama Nefesh. So they have to make sure that they, we remember in the Gemara, we learned that you took all of their blood vessels, you stuck them in the, in the bowl to make sure until the spurting blood stops. And once you have draining blood, you didn't need that anymore. But you needed all the spurting blood. So that, hold on a second, they use the hindquarters as well? By the Korban, they use the hindquarters? They use the, the, the Korban Ola, it's a chain. Could not the Corbin Ola, which could not be eaten, was completely burnt. Uh, so the Gidan Nasha is only removed when human human beings have to consume it. I, mean, I don't think they have to remove the Gidan, but all the limbs were put on, on a Corbin Ola, all the limbs. Now, for us, if you okay. want to eat the hind quarter, you can eat the hind quarter after you, you salt it and after you remove the Gidan Nasha. If you know how to trade it, there's no. You know how to do, if you know how to remove the Gidan Nasha, absolutely. In the in the in the base of Mikdash, they ate the hind quarters. They ate the good meat. If they removed the giranosha, they must have known how to do it. Okay. The Kohanim had a good time. Okay. Although most people would not simply take a cup of blood and consume it, this halacha is still extremely relevant. I remember when when Sidney told us once he came back on one of his trips from China. And he said that in the market there, they, they, the people would drink these snake blood and turtle blood. And, you know, they had markets like that. So we don't really do that. Now, due to the prohibition of consuming blood, kosher meat may not be cooked without salting it first. Blicha, since the blood that emerges from the meat when it is cooked, would then be reabsorbed into the meat, thereby prohibiting the meat from being eaten. So I want to make sure everyone understands that. If we took a piece of meat and cooked it without salting it, so the blood would come out, but then it would get reabsorbed by the meat and it would be usher for us. So that's why you got you to gotta salt it first. We will not discuss the halachas of salting meat in detail in this context, as they are somewhat lengthy. Plus, the majority of kosher meat sold today in stores is already salted and rinsed properly. So that's why, Chaim, I think they... They, they avoided doing that because they felt it was not that halakh lamaisa for everyday people because everyday people are not doing it anymore. However, it is worthwhile right, to see you, one practice. Excuse me, again? The, the, the term today used kosher salt. Is that the specific type of salt that's being used for malicha? Yes. Is it, it's a, like yes. you said, the thicker, more yes. saturated? Abs- absolutely. There, the Shulchan Aruch, there's a whole simmet it goes through exactly what kind of salt can we use. It's got to be very coarse and very thick. And the kosher salt is what's used for koshering. However, it is worthwhile to see one practical quote from the Sefer HaKashrus. HaKonin Basar Behema Chai Ava'ov Shkutu. Somebody's going to purchase kosher, either domesticated animal or chaya, like deer. A buffalo, if that's a chaya, or some kind of a ram, or what is it? a yak. Remember, we, you know, these probably, I'm not sure yak, yak is probably domesticated. So, the oaf, bird, shkutim, choy v'alei mavare in nestak shera, kidin labosser. Was this kasher properly? V'im yilav, yesh levara kama zman avar menashchita. You better be careful to know how long time it's been since the shchita. Shema kvar lo toil achshara. Hashor here means malicha, the kashering of it. Because the marachot ha kashrus lamahadrin b'derech klal, ha basar mishavekish kvar aver talich ha kshara kedas v'kidim. Meat is only sold after it's undergone the process of kashering properly. The komokam adabar chayav liyos mitsuyan b'ofen barog gabi atifa. When you buy meat, it should say very clearly, you know, it's been salted appropriately according to Allah. And the couple boss of a very low deal next she row. Let's say somebody gives you a, a, a raw piece of meat and they didn't tell you whether it was kosher or not. 
Also, levashlo, blach shor, you can't cook it unless you kasher it first. Vein lishloch basu shalo hochsher. Don't send meat that has not been kasher. Elim ke modiyam shadayin lo hochsher. Unless you make sure you inform the person you're sending it that I'm sending you an unkashered piece of meat. The above rules apply to the blood of animals and birds. But fish blood is permitted since it's not a mammal or a bird. For this reason, fish does not need to be salted prior to cooking like the meat of animals or poultry. However, if one does consume fish blood, there is concern that others may see him not realize, realize it's fish blood and think that he's consuming prohibited blood. So we have a problem of Mara science. Therefore, the Shukharach rules that it's only permitted to consume fish blood when it is recognizable, recognizable as such. I remember the Simon Shukharach says, you have to put like scales next to the, next to, let's say if you have a cup of blood and it's fish blood, you gotta put, you gotta have a simon there that it came from fish. Says Shukharach in your idea, dam dogim al mutter im kvotsu bekli. If you gathered it in a kli, osr mishu marasayim, lepichach em nikr shu midagim, yigon sheyesh po kaskasim mutter. But if you identify it, like you put next to it that it came from the fish with scales, then there's no Mars sign. The Sefer Kashrus comments that although some do have the custom of salting fish, there's no source for it in the halacha, nor is such a custom documented anywhere. By the way, after three days from the time of slaughter, kashring by malicha is no longer effective because the blood already has congealed inside. In that case, the meat is only permitted to be eaten by roasting. Then you can't cook the meat, like with water. You gotta roast it. However, in a pressing situation, Svardim only would be permitted to cook it following roasting if they first perform a process called chalita. Immersing it, you have to immerse it in hot water. Then they roast it. Then they'd be allowed to cook it. We Ashkenazim, Beyond 72 hours, cannot eat that meat through cooking. You can only eat it by roasting. If you roast the meat, you can eat it. But, and that will get rid of the, the blood, but you can't cook it afterward. You can only eat it through roasting process. What about human blood? So far, we have discussed the status of the blood of various animals. What is the halacha regarding human blood? According to Gemara Crisus, blood that has been separated from the body is permitted according to the Torah law. But the Gemara forbid it due to Mara Sayyid. In the Sech Decrees, it's Dama Tchol, right, from the spleen, Dama Lev, from dam in the heart, Dama Kloyos, blood in the kidneys, Dama Vorim, Hare Elu Belo Sase. It's a love. We're talking about from an animal. Dama Hal Cheshtayim, blood from the the animal that walks on two legs, meaning human beings, or dam shrotzim v'ramashim, dam from creeping, crawling things, right? Osir, but ve'en chayav It's only midrabon, right? Ma'en chalavna koris. V'nir chayav tov. Atanya dam shal gabi kikar. It says, if there's blood, your blood, on a, on a, Loaf of bread, you can scrape it away and eat it. The bread, blood that's still within your teeth, so you can suck it. So, according to the Gemara, blood that remains in one's mouth may be sucked and swallowed, while blood that has left the body may not. You got to scrape it away before you eat it. Rashi explains the difference between these cases as follows Dam Shalakik, Lav, Kikinso Dami, listen. You bit your tongue, and some blood came, went onto a piece of bread. It's not like you gathered the blood in a, in a cup. The lekei sura, miu mitzvahs pirush yeshbo. But you should not eat it. Abal shal bin ashinai. But if it's still within your, when you're in your teeth, that kati machuber still connected to you. I feel the mitzvahs pirush yeshbo. You have to stay away from it. Umotet zov in a choshes veloki kinsu dami. So according to Rashi, even blood found on the piece of bread is not actually forbidden, as it is not considered to have the status of being collected in utensil, which is forbidden. Rather, there's a rabbinic injunction to abstain from it, since it's no longer attached to the body. But blood that is still in the mouth, on the other hand, is entirely permitted, and you can suck it without any question. According to these sources, if blood drips from one's mouth or teeth onto food that one is eating, 
one should peel off or rinse the area on a rabbinic level. And that's what the Shulchan Aruch says, who says that the reason we should avoid it is really marisayin only. Dam adam, impurish me, man, if it's separated from him. Asr mishum marisayin. Fichach im noshach hakika bishinav. If he bit the piece of bread with his teeth, you shouldn't just eat it. Scrape it away. But blood, in the Koivet Shiurim, Ravel Khanan was killed by the Nazis. He was the Rosh Hashim in Baranovich. He had come to America in 1938 39. He was a major speaker for the Aguda, and they begged him not to go back to Baranovich. But he said, I'm the Rosh Hashiva, what, I'm not going to go back? And he was killed in 1942 in Baranovich. And uh, he was a Talmud of Chaim Soloveitchik. And he was one of the really the G'doy Le'ador. He was a fierce anti-Zionist. Uh, he was like the pen of anti-Zionism from the Aguda. And of course, we benefited having his son, Rav Simcha Wasserman, in Los Angeles, in the in Wasserman's yeshiva, until he moved it to Yerushalayim in 1975. And of course, Rav Hadash uh, was the Rosh Hashiva. We all knew him. Uh, but uh, our, my Rebbeim, Rabbi Grumman, would take us to Rabbi Wasserman's yeshiva every Purim and other times to hear from Rabbi Wasserman. And so he had connection to the, to the people, even if he didn't go to his yeshiva, because he was like a real Lithuanian Rosh Hashiva, uh, it was important that the people had exposure to him. But this is Rav, this is Rav Elchanan Wasserman, his father. So he said that although usually one is forbidden to perform any action subject to Mara's sign, regardless of whether anyone can see, in this case, it's forbidden to suck one's blood from one's mouth. What does he mean? The din in Marasayan is even Bechedre Chadorim, it's Usr. It's not just that somebody's going to see you. Once they declared something is prohibited because of Marasayan, it's not because you're going to see somebody's going to see you walking into a McDonald's and, and learn from that. No. Once it's Usr Marasayan, even in your own private kitchen, you can't do it. Like, for example, well, like, for example, drinking almond milk, if you don't have a clear simon, Maybe now it's more, it used to be that if you're going to drink milk with meat and it was almond milk, you have to have almonds next to it. There had to be a, a, a simon because otherwise it's mar sign. And then the Shukron says, and you should know even Bechadri Chadorim, you can't do it. Now it's probably different because of, you know, the, the whole industry is different. But anyways, regarding this issue, the kasha. Why should you be able to swallow the blood in your mouth if it doesn't come out? Well, because even in your in your kitchen, which is Khadri Khadorm, there's no no one there. But a kitchen, your your friends can come over, other people can come in there. But in your mouth, nobody's hanging out in your mouth. So that's, that's how we got around to the problem of Chedri Chador. The Ramah adds that if human blood or fish blood becomes mixed into a food, it does not forbid the entire mixture due to Mars sign. So if this blood that came out of you, which we say you have to scrape away, somehow got mixed with other food, it's not a problem because with Mars sign, you don't have to worry about that. It says, Really, Meikra din is permitted. It's only prohibited rabbinically, Marasai. So the mi mixture of that item is not prohibited at all. Based on the above principles, what would be the Allah in the case where one's finger is bleeding? Is it permitted to insert one's finger into one's mouth? Tosfans explains that it's permitted since it's clear where the blood is coming from. And there's no concern of Marasai that perhaps the person is consuming forbidden blood. Says Tosus Vadakomer Vedam Achish Time Shu Osir. My Rebishlo Noy to make us. That's only we don't know where it came from. Avalet's bomb at Taftif Dam. If you see your fingers bleeding, Shari, we should do Mahasam Kasi. We know for sure it's coming from there. For Lekel is Fuki, Lobadam Behem of Lobadam Chayim. There's no Mara sign that, oh, maybe he's eating other kind of blood, prohibited blood. Nevertheless, the Benish Chai writes that if the finger has stopped bleeding, then it's still included in the category of Mara sign. In Imed's bomb at Taftif Dam, Imena Yuchalan Yechaz Bob the Thieve. If it's still bleeding, you can stick your finger in your mouth. 
שני קשור מטאטף בן צבו, אבל נפסק כתיבתו. If it's not bleeding anymore, ונישר אצבע מלכלך בדם, but your finger is sort of stained with blood also על איכפת פיו משום מרסה. אוקיי. So we will leave the shear here and begin very practical so give blood spots in eggs. What kind of eggs, when is it usser, and what do we have to do to prevent it? And we will also begin the sugya of insects, tolaim. Um, and that, I believe, is the last simon. Now, can I ask a question? Did we learn the Hilchos Hanukkah? I think we did, before Hanukkah. I don't, I don't think so, Ernie. Okay, so you don't think we, at the end of this is Hilchos Hanukkah. We, we didn't learn these before? We didn't have volume four. No, this huh? is something new. Fine, then th that's how we'll conclude. Ernie, we, we could say, we could say,